Hi everyone, this lesson is on babesiosis, which is an infection from a tick bite. So we're going to talk about the tick that can lead to this infection. We'll also discuss some of the pathophysiology behind this condition. We'll also talk about some of the symptoms that can happen, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So babesiosis, as we mentioned before, is a tick-borne illness caused by babesia species. So tick-borne meaning that it is going to come from a tick bite. We'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about some of the pathophysiology. And it is going to be caused by Babesia species, so from the genus Babesia. And it's not a bacteria, but it is actually a protozoa. So it's actually a parasitic protozoa. We'll again talk about this in more detail when we talk about some of the pathophysiology. A common species, now there are many different species, but a common species, especially in the United States, is Babesia microti. Some other species include Babesia duncani and some other ones as well. Now the transmission is again going to come from a tick and it's actually more specifically from the bite of a exotis tick. So this is what an exotis tick looks like. So the exotis tick is also known as a deer tick or a black legged deer tick. So that's one method of transmission but we can also have it from iatrogenic causes. There have been cases that have been reported to be transmitted through blood transplant. So this is going to be more rare, but this has been shown or demonstrated to happen. So babesiosis can occur worldwide. So with regards to the United States, it's going to be mostly in the northern Midwest of the United States and northeastern United States, but it can also occur along the southern United States and northern Mexico. It can also occur in parts of South America like Brazil and some other countries. Europe can also be affected as well as Japan is also another place that this can occur. And we can also see it in South Africa and in Australia as well. So infection by Babesia is going to occur primarily from late spring to autumn. So this is when most of the time people are going out, they're going camping. This is why we're going to see tick-borne illnesses increasing during this time in general, but also Babesiosis. So that's something to point out here as well. And as we will see later, because the symptoms of this condition can be quite varied and, and nonspecific, this can be an important cause of fever of unknown origin. So when a patient comes in with continuous or recurrent fevers and the condition has done multiple tests and they can't find the cause, if the individual has been in particular areas that are endemic for this infection, this is going to be an important cause to think about with regards to fever of unknown origin. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of this condition. So as I mentioned before, it's going to be transmitted by the bite of a deer tick or exotis tick. This tick is going to be the same tick that can transmit the conditions of anaplasmosis and Lyme disease. Lyme disease is caused by a bacterial infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. So this is the same tick that can transmit those infections as well. So what will happen is ordinarily a deer tick is going to acquire this particular protozoa from white-footed mice or other rodent species and will then transmit it to other rodents. This is the general life cycle of this particular parasite. So that is going to be important because humans are not going to be the primary target of this parasitic protozoa. So just briefly, what happens is that when a tick feeds on a rodent that is infected with these protozoa, they are going to ingest gametocytes, which are then going to go through a process of sexual reproduction within the tick leading to something called a kinete. And kinetes are going to invade the salivary glands of the tick and eventually form what we call sporozoites. So when the next time a tick bites a rodent, those sporozoites are going to be transferred during feeding. So they're in the salivary glands, they get transferred to the other rodent, and those sporozoites are going to invade and infect erythrocytes or red blood cells. Very important because this is what's going to happen in humans as well. These sporozoites will undergo binary fission or asexual reproduction leading to the production of merozoites and merozoites will infect additional erythrocytes and this cycle will continue leading to damage of the red blood cells or erythrocytes and eventually there will be a gametocyte for another tick to come along and to ingest to continue this process. So what's important in this cycle and is going to be something that occurs in humans as well is that the sporozoites can invade and infect human erythrocytes or human red blood cells. And in the process of that infection and invasion, 
there can be a rupturing and escape out of erythrocytes. This is going to be important because this will be a part of some of the signs and symptoms we'll discuss later. As I mentioned before, humans are going to be opportunistic hosts. They're not going to be the primary target for this particular parasitic protozoa. They're actually an end host, meaning that once a human gets it, they're not going to be a part of this cycle we just talked about. They're not going to be the primary target as would be a rodent, for instance. Now, in humans, when a tick does bite them, so if they're out camping, you're going through the woods, and there's a deer tick that happens to latch on and start to bite, it will take at least 36 hours of attachment for infection to occur. So a lot of times people think that once they get bit, even in a very short period of time, the bacteria can be transmitted or the protozoa or infective agent can be transmitted. It's often going to take a very long period of time. And in this case, a lot of times it can be at least 36 hours. So a day and a half, a very long period of attachment. The problem is that these ticks can be often very small, so they can be hard to spot. So it's important to, especially when you're in those endemic areas, when you come back home, to check over your body to make sure there's no little tiny tick on you, because it's going to take some time for attachment so that these sporozoites can be transmitted into the bloodstream and infect erythrocytes. So that's important to point out here. Another important part of all of this pathophysiology is that the spleen is very important. The patient's spleen is critical in the immune function against Babesia. So this is a reason why Babesia infections are going to be more likely to occur in patients with splenic issues. So if they don't have a spleen, for instance, or if they have splenic dysfunction, or if they have hepatosplenomegaly due to issues with their liver, for instance, anything like that, or if the patient has poor immune functioning in general, so patients very, very old or very, very young, patients with severe diabetes are going to be more at risk for getting this infection. And the reason that the spleen is so important is because the spleen recognizes infected erythrocytes or those infected red blood cells and targets them for destruction by macrophages. So the reticuloendothelial system within the spleen is going to be important in taking care of this infection before it becomes too severe or becomes too widespread within the body. And another important point to note here is that once these Babesia organisms get into the body, it takes about one to nine weeks before we see symptoms. So from the time that there's a transmission of these Babesia protozoa from a tick bite, again, that is also going to take some time, 36 hours or so, to the time when a patient starts to experience symptoms, that's the incubation period, is going to be anywhere from one to nine weeks. Most commonly though, it's gonna be anywhere from one to three weeks, but in some cases up to nine weeks. So let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms that can occur in patients who have babesiosis. In some cases, patients can be asymptomatic, meaning that they have no symptoms at all. These can often be in cases where patients are young, healthy, they don't have any splenic issues, no issues with spleen functioning. They're more likely to be asymptomatic and not experience any symptoms. But in those individuals that perhaps have poor spleen functioning, or if they have poor immune system functioning, they can start to have symptoms, and symptoms will occur gradually. They can be very nonspecific, very vague symptoms. Some of these include fatigue, malaise, weakness, so feeling very, very tired. Malaise is just having a general sense of feeling unwell, feeling sick. They can have anorexia, meaning that they lose their appetite. They can have fever and chills. So this is going to be a very important finding in this condition. The fevers can be sustained, meaning that they're continuous, or they can be intermittent, they can come and go. And the temperature can be as high as 40 degrees Celsius, and the chills are often going to be shaking chills. And they can have a lot of sweating diaphoresis. So these are going to be some of the most common symptoms of infection. Fatigue, malaise, weakness, fever, and chills. So as you can see, these symptoms can be very nonspecific and vague. So as you can see, these signs and symptoms are quite nonspecific and vague. We can see these in other types of infections. So that's the reason why we can see an issue with diagnosing this condition. It is going to be something, again, that we would put as a potential cause of fever of unknown origin. Again, that's important to point out here. And the way these fever and chills can occur and the fact that 
Babesia can enter into red blood cells is also the reason why we can call this a malaria-like condition. So malaria, so plasmodium species are also protozoa. They enter into red blood cells and patients can have cyclical fevers. Depending on the species, the fevers can be more continuous or more intermittent, but it's going to be a similar pattern. Another non-specific finding we can see is headaches, arthrologists, so achy joints, nausea and vomiting can also occur. There can also be psychological changes in some patients. They can feel more depressed. They can have more emotional instability, so they can feel emotionally unstable. And they can also have altered sensorium, so their senses, their perception of things can be altered as well. But these will be more rare findings. Now, what is a more specific finding for babesiosis is hemolytic anemia. So because those Babesia protozoa enter into red blood cells, they can destroy those red blood cells in the process of rupturing and spreading to other ones, we can get hemolytic anemia. So in order to understand some of the findings we're going to see with hemolytic anemia, it's important to look at what happens when a red blood cell gets broken down. What are the, some of the components of a red blood cell? So just to start, a reticulocyte is an immature red blood cell, and then this is an erythrocyte, a red blood cell, a mature one. And what happens is when an erythrocyte breaks apart, the erythrocyte contains high amounts of lactate dehydrogenase. This is a particular enzyme. So that can be released into the plasma of the blood. And red blood cells are essentially bags of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen to tissues and can also carry CO2 away from tissues. So that hemoglobin can be spilled out into the plasma. It can be bound by haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is a protein in the blood that actually binds hemoglobin. So hemoglobin itself can cause some damage to other cells. So it can be bound by haptoglobin or that hemoglobin can be broken down further into amino acids and also having the heme part of hemoglobin removed. Now the heme then can be processed into bilirubin and that is going to lead to particular findings as well. So if we were to look at hemolytic anemia, what happens is that there's going to be an increase in LDH. So because we're breaking open a lot of red blood cells, more LDH is going to be released. We can also see decreased hemoglobin. This makes sense. Being spilled out of red blood cells and broken down further. So we're going to have decreased hemoglobin levels. We're also going to have low haptoglobin. What this means is that there's low free haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is being bound to hemoglobin. So this actually reduces free haptoglobin. We're also going to see increased bilirubin. Bilirubin is a breakdown product of heme. So we're going to see increased bilirubin. Along with all this, we can see jaundice. So bilirubin can lead to jaundice. Jaundice is going to be a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. And along with this, we can see dark urine. So we can see this darkening coloration of the urine also from high levels of bilirubin. Now, I did mention that this is going to be a more specific finding with regards to babesiosis, but this is only going to occur in a minority of cases. So it's not going to occur as frequently as it does in malarial infections. Again, malaria is where plasmodium protozoa enter into the red blood cell and cause its destruction as well. So that can also lead to hemolytic anemia, but hemolytic anemia is not going to occur as frequently as it does in malaria. So that's important to point out here as well. Another important finding in this condition that's more specific to babesiosis is issues with the spleen. We talked about the fact that the spleen is important for dealing with those infected erythrocytes. So what we can see is splenomegaly in this condition. Splenomegaly is going to be an enlarged spleen. So it increases in size. This can lead to several different things, including early satiety. So what early satiety is, is that a patient feels full faster. So the patient might feel hungry, but as soon as they start to eat, they can feel full pretty quickly. And the reason is because if we look at this diagram here, the spleen is right next to the stomach. If it gets enlarged, it starts to push on the stomach. The expansion of the stomach becomes smaller and smaller. So if you were to eat food and into your stomach, the spleen is pushing on the stomach, making you feel full. So this is the reason why we can see early satiety and also loss of appetite. If the spleen becomes so enlarged, your stomach can feel like it's full. So this is the reason why there may be loss of appetite. And along with this, we can see weight loss. And because the spleen is enlarging, it becomes a bit dysfunctional. And it can lead to what we call hyposplenism, so a decreased functioning of the spleen. This can actually increase the risk of infection with encapsulated organisms overall. So this is often, again, not going to occur in many patients. It's going to occur in a very select few patients. But this is something that can occur when patients don't have a spleen or if they have hyposplenism, a decreased splenic functioning, 
they're at an increased risk of infection with encapsulated organisms like Streptococcus pneumoniae, for instance. So that's something to think about here. And then patients with an enlarged spleen in general are at an increased risk of splenic rupture, a rupturing of the spleen. This can occur also in Epstein-Barr virus mononucleosis, for instance. So when we have splenomegaly, we want to avoid contact sports. That's going to be important because the spleen is at an increased risk of rupturing. And then some other complications that are very, very rare, but I do want to mention here is cardiomyopathy. So some patients can have myocardial infarction or congestive heart failure. Again, these are going to be patients who have very poor immune functioning or have no spleen or a low splenic functioning at the beginning before they become infected. They can have a worsening outcome or a worsening prognosis. And then renal dysfunction is also another finding in some patients. So renal insufficiency and even renal failure in some patients. So again, rare, but some complications to point out here. How is babesiosis diagnosed and treated? So the diagnosis is going to be something that we have to be suspicious of. It's going to be oftentimes those non-specific, vague signs and symptoms we talked about at the beginning. So it's not going to be some of those more key findings like hemolytic anemia and splenomegaly, which might trigger our thought of perhaps it being babesiosis. It's often going to be some of those more vague ones. Patients fatigue, they feel weak, they experience malaise, they have high fever, but all the tests that are performed don't show anything. So this is when we want to think about babesiosis, especially if they're from some of those areas like in the United States, the North Midwestern part or the Northeastern part. So we can often start with blood work. So doing a complete blood count or CBC and differential. So blood findings can show signs of hemolytic anemia. We talked about high LDH, low hemoglobin those types of findings. We can also see thrombocytopenia, low platelet count. This can occur due to splenomegaly. And we can also see lymphopenia, which is a low lymphocyte count. It's important to check creatinine and blood urea nitrogen because in some cases, patients can have renal failure or renal insufficiency. What's going to be key with regards to diagnosing is going to be using a right stain or jam sustain. So what can be found is something called intraerythrocytic ring with central pallor. This is going to be something that can be found in babesiosis, but it can also be something that can be found in plasmodium falciparum infection. So that's something to point out here as well. And what's a key test question or answer is the finding of a Maltese cross. So if we were to look at this image here, we can see this tetrad. This is the Maltese cross. This is pathognomonic for babesiosis. So this is something to look out for. This is, again, an important test question for babesiosis infections. Maltese cross, something that can be found on these stains, and that's something to point out here as well. And we can also look for antibody titers and PCR as well for this infection. So once the diagnosis has been made, how is it treated? So the first line of treatment for babesiosis is atovacone and azithromycin, this combination therapy. And second line, or an alternative way of treating this, is with clindamycin and quinine. So those are the potential treatments for babesiosis. Please check out my lesson on Lyme disease. And also, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.